Be right with you. All right. <laughs> He's got to go yell at his kids. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kellen. Nice to meet hey, you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. I'm kind of, uh, he'll probably explain. I, I never quite know how to explain what I am, <laughs> Trevor. Uh, so. Yeah, I will explain. <laughs> cool. <laughs> I'm just the random lady in the room. Right. <laughs> hey, Jay. Hey. Um, so Kellen, uh, Kellen is my friend who, she's my web designer. She's the graphic artist for the brand. And she's also just someone I've known for a while. And um, she is a woman who doesn't have cancer. So that's the perfect offset to me for this show because I can get lost in the cancer weeds and then she's there to pull, pull me out. Yes. <laughs> or, yeah. And I also kind of tend to, when he's doing these kind of interviews, you guys know a lot of terminology that a lot of people don't know. And right. so I'll oftentimes be like, all right, guys, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, right, which, is, which is great because there's going to be people listening to this who need that kind of like, yeah, yeah you got to, it can be, it can be almost like business speak. We do cancer speak, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so you got a great setup there, Jay. I, I was telling no. Kellen, you're like a Renaissance man. You do a little bit of everything. What is the recording uh, studio uh, this, for? This is virtual. <laughs> no, no, oh, I mean the, the, he's got the a virtual background. Oh no, no, just the mic yeah, and yeah. the the mic and everything. Oh no, so I've done voiceovers before, like for videos and stuff for family. So I had a mic. Funny story, I left it on. My power supply broke. I stepped on it today. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh no, what am I gonna do? Yeah, so the mic's actually not on, but I left it as a prop. <laughs> oh, okay. um, so can we do a backup? So um, can you record it uh, as a voice memo? Yes, it's it's going right now. Okay, so, perfect. Yeah, yeah, perfect. I just wanted to make sure that so I think for some of these we're going to actually rely on Zoom because, um, for a number of reasons. But for this one, we'll just right. have both. Okay, cool. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. sometimes the Zoom audio gets affected by um, slow Wi-Fi, like it you know oh, it's, it lags. Yeah. Um, where yeah. you know because we've had audio with other people where it might lag on the Zoom, but in their voice memo, it's clear. Right. So. Yeah. So, so how are you? How are things going? They're going well. Yeah. As well as they can be right now. <laughs> yeah. 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 But things are good. Um, can't really complain. Just okay. Step, step healthy. You're, you're feeling healthy. Yeah. Bloods are good. Healthy. Yes. I had a great checkup. What? Yeah. 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 All the counts are good again. So, um, yeah. Okay. Can't awesome. Complain. Well then we'll just launch right in then. I, so our format is, Kellen also really helps us get that like conversational format. So there's going to be like some more, definitely like more back and forth, more just like an open conversation with the three of us than some of the podcasts where it's just like long one-on-one -on -one stuff. Um, yeah. So I'm just introduce, we'll say, I'll say, hi, I'll introduce you. And then, and then I just have, I have some bullet points to go over, but we can also just let the conversation kind of flow if that works with you. Sure. Yeah. 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 That okay. Works. Um, and let me, before I do the intro, let me make sure that I have it correct. You haven't had a birthday yet. You're 35? Yes. You live in Dallas, native Californian. Yep. And chronic myeloid leukemia survivor. Yes. Um, okay, awesome. I think we're ready to go. Yeah, cool. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. Uh, it is a very exciting honor today to have Jay Carter on the show with us. Um, and also we have Kellen with us today. Hi, hey, Kellen. Hey, how are you? I'm doing well. Um, so Jay Carter, I uh, met Jay online. He is a, through the cancer, through the cancer networks that I refer to as Cancerland. Uh, Jay is 35 years old. He's native Californian. He lives in Dallas now. He um, is a, he's 35, but he was, Jay, I'm just going to bring you in right, right away here. When were, how old were you when you were diagnosed with chronic yeah. myeloid leukemia? I was uh, 26 when I was diagnosed, so just about nine years ago now. So yeah. 26 years old, he's, he gets diagnosed yeah. with chronic myeloid leukemia, which we will get into today. Jay is also a member of the Man Up to Cancer community, and yeah. I, I gravitated toward Jay right away because I started seeing some of the photos that he would post online and, and his social media presence, and he is just this outdoor, like he says he's a software engineer slash graphic designer, but I'm pretty sure he's actually an outdoor adventure model. 
I mean, true or false? Sure, I'll take that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he, he's like snowboarding and paddleboarding and and skiing and like uh, whitewater rafting, and you could just and he's got a smile. Like the smile on his face when he's doing this stuff is so awesome that you can't help but gravitate toward him. So I'm so glad that he's part of our community and getting to meet him. Um, yeah. So let's just jump right into it. We're going to talk about the cancer experience today. I posted on the, in the men's group today that I'm looking for an alternative name for the cancer journey. Um, but because, you know, to me, it's like we use the word journey, but that it's like indicative of like a cruise, something nice. Like there's definitely no, like, you don't seem like people aren't generally trying to kill you on a journey. So (laughs) Jay, I don't know. Jay, do you, what kind of language do you use when you tell people about your cancer experience or journey or, or we, we, sometimes we lack language. Yeah, no, I was going to say, I, I usually just say journey or experience. Yep. It, it's kind of tough. Um, cause it, uh, honestly, like it's, it's not a good descriptor to describe what we're going through, but it, like it is a journey. You know, I, I think back to first being diagnosed hmm. and, uh, just knowing what I know now and everything I've gone through it, it's a journey, <laughs> you know, and yeah. it, constantly learning and I don't know. So I, Yeah, no, I I think you're right. And I think that if you look at it as a journey in terms of being suggestive of growth, I think that there's definitely something there. And I think reading your, your writings and seeing you on social media, I I think, and we're going to get into your growth today as well. Um, Have you, you seem like a Renaissance man to me though. You have lots of interests. So music, um, technology, culture, uh, obviously sports. Have you always been um, that kind of a well-rounded person? person or has that developed more lately? Yeah, I, I've always been that way, sort of. I, when I was six, uh, my parents enrolled me in uh, piano lessons. So I started taking piano lessons then. I was really active in church and the choir and sports, of course. And, you know, as kids, we were always in the outdoors. So we had trails and pretty cl- close to my house. So we'd go out, you know, ride our bikes on the trails. And then summertime, we're at the lake. So always uh, just doing a lot of stuff. You know? Yeah. Being active, uh, it was the 90s. We didn't have the internet yet. <laughs> <laughs> and, and where was home for you as a kid? Home was in uh, Vacaville, California. So uh, just north of San Francisco, in between San Francisco and Sacramento. So, yeah. Is it a large town? I've never heard of it. Is it fairly large or is it small? Uh, it's smaller. It's getting bigger now. Uh, there are about 100,000 people Okay. Uh, now. But I think there were maybe... Yeah, so it's not small, but it's not big. <laughs> is it a big shift yeah. to go from that kind of community to, I mean, do you live in like the urban area of Dallas? Because I can't yeah. imagine that shift. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I live in Dallas proper now. Um, oh, okay. Before moving down, I lived in Sacramento for four years. So that's kind of a city, fairly large city. Uh, so it wasn't too much of a difference. But uh, I will say there was a, a bit of a cultural, cultural shock just moving from the West Coast to the South, basically, or Southwest, whatever. Texas is considered, you know, yeah. <laughs> like people are friendly for the most part, but there are just a lot of differences, like some good for that. I'm not going to say yeah. what they are, but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you went to college in, you went to college in California, right? Yes. I went to UC Davis. It's just outside of uh, Sacramento. So. so you get done with UC Davis, you start um, into your twenties, you, you start, what was the career path that you started out, you know, before cancer? Uh, so I finished up at Davis. I took some classes at Sacramento State too for a while. That's why I was in Sacramento. And uh, what I wanted to do, I wanted to get into the medical field. And so I uh, wasn't pretty much like it was going to be PT or orthopedic surgeon. Like those are two different things, but it's like, wow. it's all that. <laughs> Right. <laughs> it's like, I'm really curious how it gets to graphic designer from there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very interesting story. So, uh, so I moved to Dallas uh, partly because I had an internship um, with one of the hospitals here. And also my dad lived here at the time and he was getting pretty sick. And so I came down uh, to help uh, take care of him. My brother moved down maybe three months before I did. Mm-hmm. And so everything came to sort of line up uh, perfectly, you know, the internship and then uh, my brother's here too. So things are going well for three months. And then uh, three months in, I was diagnosed with leukemia. And so, um, yeah, it, it was pretty rough. But for the most part, like for the first six months of my diagnosis, like life remained the same pretty much. I uh, I had labs, you know, every two weeks or so, but I could still intern and like, I had a part-time job selling sports memorabilia at uh, 
the Cowboy Stadium. So that's yeah. how we can Cowboys fan, by the way. <laughs> uh, but uh, it things were normal until my seventh month checkup. I went in and I found out I relapsed. And that was kind of a, it was a bad day because uh, up until that point, I was taking pills only to um, stay in remission. I guess right. I, I'm in remission. And my whole mantra was, yeah, I have cancer, but at least I only have to take pills. I don't have to do real chemo. <laughs> and so during that checkup, I found out like, hey, I have to start real chemo and get ready for a stem cell transplant. So let so, me interrupt you right there. Sorry, but yeah. um, introduce for those of, for those listeners who might not know about CML, give us the, the cliff notes on what it is. Okay, so it's a um, basically a blood disorder um, of the bone marrow. And the type I had, I had uh, Philadelphia positive. Uh, so it, it's, long story short, it's it's a mutation of the um, nine and 22 chromos chromosomes, basically. They translocate mm -hmm. and that causes the leukemia. And so uh, the, the meds I was on at first, they're tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And the tyrosine kinase is a protein that the uh, chromosomes need to swap. And so uh, taking those inhibitors, it prevents them from being able to swap and it basically uh, stops the cancer from growing in its track. So it's a targeted therapy. And so, yeah. <laughs> so so uh, now, Kellen, I told you Jay was wicked smart. Right? <laughs> I, I'm trying to follow what he just said, but I, I think I got the okay. basics of it. No, it's good. Um, and, and is it a sporadic thing or a genetic thing? Or was there an explanation as to why you got this, especially, you know, in your, I mean, it, I guess this is something that can strike at any age. Yeah, so no, like this is normally uh, the type of uh, leukemia that I had. It's normally seen in older males, uh, 65 and older, mm. or little children. So they really didn't know like what caused it, which um, funny story, I probably had it for about 18 months or so before being diagnosed because uh, I used to give blood on campus. Oh, and, wow. Uh, during a blood drive, uh, I gave blood one day and the very next day, a nurse calls from the blood center and she's like, uh, hey, how are you doing? How are you feeling? It's like, I'm good. And she's like, uh, can you do me a favor and go to the doctors and get checked out? I was like, for what? And she's like, your, your white blood cell count seems to be a little bit high. Mm. I was like, oh no, I have a cut on my finger. It's no big deal. That's probably what caused it. And she's like, no, go, go to the doctors. Right. <laughs> like, you were trying to like Google explain your way out of it. You're like, no, yeah, no, no. Exactly. Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, and like, with school and everything, I know a little bit to know it's like, oh no, it's just that cut. It's fine. So totally disregarded or didn't go to the hospital or didn't go to the doctors. And then 18 months later, I'm diagnosed with leukemia. So she was right. Um, so yeah, and, but, so, but you had no like frame of reference around in your, in your family or, or anything like that to suggest any, you know, had you known anyone with leukemia in your service? Not, yeah, not in my family. Um, part of the reasons, funny story, part of the reasons I, everything's a funny story. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's good. <laughs> Although I have uh, a feeling that when they are funny stories about cancer, they might be a little less funny yeah. and a little more <laughs> just intriguing. Yeah. 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 So, uh, growing up, there was, um, a little girl in my church and she was diagnosed with leukemia and, uh, they, uh, you know, being black, like it's hard to find donors, uh, just because of our, genetic makeup were mixed from sure. like, yeah. all over. And so I remember that like, that had a huge impact on me as a child. I was maybe seven or eight, but uh, they did like the bone marrow donor drive and things like that. And so as I got older and got into college, it's like, oh, I might as well give blood. And I got swabbed for, uh, to become a part of the bone marrow drive and things like that, just right. to, you know, that impacted me. And so well, that's where I was going with that. So yeah, no. So I mean, that early experience, though, and that exposure to that, and then getting involved as a donor. I mean, that. So there was a piece of you that, I don't know, there was a little foreshadowing or something in your brain that. So when you did get this news, um, there there was a little bit of background there. Yes. Um, so so yeah. So back to the. So you're lining up for a stem cell transplant. What what is that involved? You know, for us lay people. Um, what does that involve and and why did you need to have one? So um, I pretty much need to have a stem cell transplant to have the best um, odds at long-term survival. Mm -hmm. That's the way it explained to me. Um, because after I relapsed, uh, once I relapsed that first time, like my numbers were all over the place. And uh, the goal uh, 
for the transplant. First, I had to go through eight rounds of chemos, hyper CVAD, and I had to do eight rounds of chemo uh, just to get my counts under control. And from there, I could have uh, started taking the pills again or had a stem cell transplant. And my doctors decided, and I did too, that the best chances of like not having to deal with this anymore was to have a stem cell transplant. So that's what I did. And um, yeah, and yeah. what's and what's um you know how does that work? And how yeah. long were you for that? Yeah, so uh, each round of the chemo, the eight, I had eight rounds of the chemo before the transplant. Each round, I was inpatient. I was hospitalized for uh, five or six days um, at a time. And wow, uh, chemo would run overnight. So they'd started around one thirty or so in the morning, and it finished up around uh, I don't know four or five in the morning. And so you know, being pumped full of steroids and, you know, <laughs> um, like the Ativan, uh, Benadryl, just all that stuff. You just whack That's that heavy. Energy, yeah. Right. Like there's a lot of stuff and like, I can't go to sleep. It's the middle of the night. I'm trying to like sleep. People are coming in and out. Uh, so one of the things I started doing was just walking the halls at night. It's just yeah. like, I can't lay here and, you know, just take this. Like I'm going to do something different right so i'd get up and walk i'd go into the family visiting area and like do squats holding on the pole just anything to be active <laughs> you know? so that went on for um you know eight eight months eight rounds basically it, it's mm -hmm. once a month. I'd, I'd go in for a week have three weeks off and depending on my counts um they would uh i'd be able to continue with the next round or i'd have to wait a few months and or wait a few weeks and have like blood transfusions and platelet transfusions and things like that so yeah during it, yeah <laughs> during that time is this also during the time that your father is also you know dealing with his health and and your brother like what is the family structure feeling like at that time because it sounds like that could be overwhelming mm. for you know yeah it, it could have been overwhelming but surprisingly it wasn't so my dad was dealing with prostate cancer at the time and he had radiation beads implanted so um, for the most part, I would drive myself to the hospital, uh, and my, my brother was taking care of my dad. Uh, but we had this going on here in Texas and back home, my grandmother also got sick with breast cancer wow. too. So like there was a lot going on in the family. And, uh, I will say one thing that got me through, um, mm. treatments and things like that. Like, so my grandmother and I would talk all the time when we were in the hospital. Um, yeah and yeah yeah i mean that's I, the, it, 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 it was uh very impactful cause, <laughs> yeah we would uh, like, yeah it sounds like you guys actually were able to you i mean although different cancers similar you know support and you could at least both say to each other how much this sucks <laughs> instead of having somebody tell you you'll fight it you'll be fine right, right. like <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the things we'd say like, we have to we have to be strong for each other that's what she right oh. yeah and i still have a really really sweet um voicemail from her the day before my transplant like i was sleeping or something and she called and left a voicemail and yeah it's it's good it, it's one of those good things i'm i'm glad i have it um i miss yeah. her dearly she passed away maybe a year after my transplant and so yeah, <laughs> it's life. I mean, the family, right? I mean, those yeah. those bonds and family getting you through. You also mentioned another thing that got you through, which was what we referenced to earlier, was your physical nature and your your will to to walk when you were in chemo, yeah. and then begin doing things as soon as you could. Talk a little bit about your physical nature and how that has been a theme for you to to getting through all this. Uh, yeah. So. Um, I guess the part that really, um, I don't know, drove the point home to me that I needed to stay active during treatment was, um, the first, uh, round of chemo in the hospital, it was kind of a shock. It's like, oh, this is all being thrown at me. It's so sudden. It was Memorial Day weekend, two of 2012. And, um, uh, so just going through the process of being in the hospital and not expecting that, um, that first round, I was up all the time. It's like, okay, I got to stay active, do this, do that. I'm not going to just sit in bed and take this. Uh, but by the second round, um, the shock had sort of set in a little bit, right? And so it really dawned on me like, hey, I have cancer. And so instead of being active that time, I basically laid in bed the entire treatment. Mm. And it um, 
the difference was noticeable once treatment like that session ended like i got home in two two three days later i felt like absolute crap right and the only difference was i didn't move <laughs> at all like <laughs> that cycle and so like going through that it's like okay there's never going to be another time where i'm just laying in bed taking this and so i don't know it staying active during treatment um made me feel better but it also kept my mind occupied too um, right yeah 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 so yeah I did. yeah i mean um, and that's been a and as you've been able to resume your activity so take us beyond your so you got out of treatment and then have you been no evidence of disease or remission or what's the terminology where are you at in your cancer i'm gonna call it a cruise today where are you yeah, on your cancer cruise? Works. My cancer cruise. I like that. Because <laughs> yeah, those have had actually some really bad news. So there you go. You're yeah. right on that. Like. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. yeah. yeah. Uh, so currently I've, I've been in remission since uh, it's been about three years now, uh, March of 2017. Awesome. Uh, yeah. I had a slight relapse at the end of 2016. And so I had to start taking uh, the TKIs again, but they got me in remission again. But you know, even that's been a journey, um, like after the transplant. So I finished up in April of 2013 with the whole process and I was declared in remission. Um, what was it? About a year later. And for me, remission is they can't detect any of the um, mutated chromosomes. Okay. Or, or like the, the level's really low. So I, I've had those levels undetectable now for three years, but um yeah, so I'd go in every three months and uh, have regular labs, and they'd run the um, genetic testing for that, too. And so, yeah, it's... it's. Um, Are there symptoms that you would notice? Because it sounds like you kind of had relapses, uh, you know, two or three times. Yeah. And were there any signs that you started feeling? And so that now, even as you're you know, in remission, if you had a similar sign, it kind of deals with your mental health, you know, like that you're like, Oh God, is this, you know, cause I can't even imagine like if you're kind of always living on this little precipice and you have these little signs that you noticed before, and they might be similar to something as, as, you know, regular as a common cold. And then you're dealing with that. And so everything is getting second guessed. And so your mental health during that time can really seem like it would be a struggle. Sure. Yeah. So uh, a few of the signs and symptoms, um, lower back pain, um, night sweats too. Uh, these are all things I experienced, by the way, before I was initially diagnosed. And I just mm. wrote them off as being uh, new to Texas, right? So I came like in the summer. And so I was having nights. So sweats. Texas sweats are, yeah, yeah that's, right? that's actually <laughs> true, right? <laughs> yeah. So I'd wake up in the middle of the night and like my sheets are soaked. And I was like, oh, it just must be the humidity or something. Or I'd have random lower back pain and or mm -hmm. Uh, random bruising on my body and it's like oh I must have just like hit myself at the gym and I don't remember it but like that had to be what happened right yeah <laughs> uh, other things too like uh, random dizziness uh, fatigue uh, which a couple of years ago I I started I thought I relapsed um, just because like I'd be out for a run or jog or something and get really dizzy like all of a sudden and there were a couple of times I fell I even like busted up my knees just like randomly jogging, like not trip, huh. I didn't trip or anything like that. And so um, knowing what those signs and symptoms are, every time something like that pops up, like it's, it's a total, uh, mm. it, it, it <laughs> messes with my mind a little bit. Mind <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I was trying to find, I forgot a, a nice way to put that. But yeah. 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 Exactly what it is. I don't know. I think we've sworn on this before. Oh yeah. Yeah. You I mean, know, I I'm comfortable with uh, some, some words. I just, I'm not sure about dropping F-bombs yet. I'm not like, <laughs> right. maybe by episode 12, you'll just yeah. start back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I know exactly what Jay is talking about. You know, yeah. like if I get certain feeling in my abdomen that I'm just like, oh, that, mm, that's a little uncomfortable. And, and pain, after you've had cancer or during cancer, you know, pain doesn't just become, it's not just pain anymore. Right. It, it's, it's everything. It's a signal. Yeah. 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 Um, so tell us, the, okay, the foundational premise of Man Up to Cancer is to encourage men to reach out, connect, accept help, avoid isolation during, during the cancer cruise. Now, right. so some of the themes we talk about are isolation, loss of identity, shame. You know, as I talk about those things, um, you're in your mid to late 20s when you get this, um, 
you know, what resonates with you in your journey in terms of facing some of those issues? Like if there's one that just jumps out at you or a couple. Yeah. So, um, when I was down in Houston for my treatment, uh, I, I had to live there for three months. Um, and I was living in a hotel, like going back and forth to the hospital every day on a shuttle. And, uh, one morning, uh, another younger guy gets on and, uh, he has like a ton of food and he's just like slamming food in his mouth. I'm like, Hey, what's up, dude? And he's like, Hey, what's up? And like, that was it. But the next day we talked a little bit and he looks at me, he's like, who are you going to visit? And I was like, I'm a patient. He's like, you're a patient too. So am I, you know? So we started chatting and it turns out he lives or he lived in the Dallas area and we're both Cowboys fans. So it's like one of those uh, stepbrother moments, like, Oh, nice. Friends? You know? So we became friends and uh, just being able to chat with him. This was maybe, um, what, two years now into my cancer cruise, right? And uh, just being able to chat with him about uh, everything, it, it made me uh, finally feel uh, heard by someone, yeah. that, you know, and so like some of that uh, isolation that I faced or like feeling that uh, no one really understood my experience. Because I talked to my friends, I talked to, you know, family members, things like that, but no one was my age going through cancer that, um, I felt like they didn't get it. And so talking uh, with this guy, um, I felt uh, I wasn't alone. Yeah, that's it. It's really simple. Like yeah. It's, a, it's a, just a very simple concept. When, even if you have one person like that who emerges and, and you can connect with and you don't feel alone, it's such a powerful thing. Yeah. Um, so you have channeled your, you've channeled, you've been on this cruise for a while. Now you're sort of like becoming a social director. Like you're employed by the cruise lines. Now you can help others, right? So yeah. <laughs> you've become an advocate. Tell us a little bit about Epic Experience and some of the other work that you've done to um, to work on this um, you know, awareness and advocacy. Yeah, so the same buddy I was just telling you about, uh, this was in December of 2014, he hit me up and he's like, hey, there's this uh, organization out in Colorado and they do ski trips for cancer survivors. I just signed up and they need more people. You want to go? It's like, uh, yes. <laughs> so I, signed up. <laughs> I signed up and two weeks later, I was in uh, Colorado with Epic Experience. And uh, that week was so uh, life-changing because here I had a whole group of um, cancer survivors and they just got it. And uh, we'd have small group chats and campfire chats too but we're also I, I always say there's a good mix of um uh play like fun and like heavy stuff too nice so like yeah. Morning, yeah we'd have chats and then we'd go out and play and then come back and have more chats too so just being around that sort of um the a group of people again who just get it 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 uh once the the week was over i was like i i need to stay connected somehow. And it just so happens that their website needed help at the time. So <laughs> <laughs> I whispered in it, so it was like, hey, uh, you guys need help with your site. And so that's how I started working with them. It's been five years now. And um, every camp I've done, I think 20 camps now, 21, something like that. And every camp is so unique and special. But what draws me back is the discussions, you know, like the adventures are fun. I love them. But like just having that time with other survivors in intimate settings to just be able to chat about stuff like no outside noise nothing just talking about this whole cancer cruise right it it uh seeing their progress over the week helps me but also like hearing their stories helps me as well you know it's like i'm still going through this stuff you know like it never goes away <laughs> like, yeah and, and i and i do have to give a shout out to colin and and those folks up in colorado colin oh, yeah. was, i think colin was the one who suggested that i reach out to you and yeah and start you know our friendship which has been amazing so yeah right. so they so they do a great job check out epic experience for sure. sure um a little bit about your your evolution then professionally so you were interested in medicine but then as as kellen was saying earlier she wants to hear a little bit about how you got into you know software engineering graphic design You're that like is the... not how i got into graphic design I, <laughs> I did not get into design and the artistic field by thinking i want to be a doctor yeah, like first a pediatric surgeon, <laughs> no <right>? yeah that's <laughs> not <laughs> So sure, uh, one of my, as I was going through uh, treatment, one of my former lab partners back in Sacramento uh, was getting ready to open a gym. And uh, he's, he hit me up, he's like, hey, you were always the techie person in our lab group. Uh, can you help me with a website, right? And so like, I, I was the techie person. I was always doing, you know, random stuff that I probably shouldn't 
have been doing, but I did. <laughs> so uh, I ended up building his site. And then um, maybe a few months after I finished that, I was on a, a men's retreat with uh, Real Recovery Oklahoma. And uh, they're a fly fishing group uh, nationwide, too. They do retreats all over, all over the U.S. Yeah. Um, so one night after dinner on that retreat, uh, the conversation came up. It's like, what's something you've had a chance to do that you wouldn't have done if it weren't for cancer? And so I started talking about how I built my buddy's gym or gym website, right? Yes. Yeah. So afterwards, uh, uh, Martin, the head guy, said, "Hey, Jay, can you help us out with our site?" <laughs> so that's <laughs> that is how it happens. I feel yeah, like right. once, <laughs> once somebody knows you, they're like, "Oh." So just so Jay, you might not relate to this, but up here in Maine, it's like if you have a pickup truck. Right. Oh yeah, my brother's got a truck. Like so, you, you kind of yeah. you don't want to have that skill, but you do. So you're the guy with the web skills. Like oh hey, yeah. we got we need yeah, you. Exactly. <laughs> Everyone needs like graphics and web stuff done all the time. I'm sure you know. Kind of like yeah. That. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all, you know, although it is funny because um, I find I I don't know about you and your profession, but once I've gotten to a certain place, I I we have my business has a website. I don't uh -huh. get any business through my website. Oh, yeah. Like, it's like <laughs> I'm the same way. I've been updated my website or portfolio in like two and a half, three years yeah. now. I, I haven't needed to. Like, it was just word of mouth and, you know, yeah. things like that. Yep. Yeah. So I, I built uh, the Real Recovery uh, web, website, um, the Oklahoma version, and then uh, Epic. And, um, you know, things, stuff with my immune system wasn't. Uh, wasn't looking great. Like I could have gotten the clearance to go back into the medical field, but I would have had to have a, sign, a waiver signed and things right. like that. It just wasn't a safe place for me to be with a weak immune system. And so uh, again, my buddy, <laughs> he's like, well, why don't you just start doing web stuff full time? Like there's obviously a need. And so he, he kind of pushed me in that direction and uh, it sort of took off. <laughs> so you're know. one of those people with a, a degree that you could have probably not bothered with like in the sense of like you were going in one direction and you're you know it it sounds like in some ways being diagnosed younger changed your path so that at least you hadn't gotten in so far into your medical profession because that takes so many years yes, <laughs> so right <laughs> intense learning that you it would have been so hard to pivot you know oh, you know yeah. once you had gotten so committed definitely i feel like i I was still at that beginning stages, beginning stages of it. And so uh, just being able to um, pivot like that and right. web stuff, like 100% well self-taught, but like it's stuff I've always done on the side, like it's always been a passion. Of well, like, yeah, I mean, and it's interesting. <laughs> it's really interesting. I think we hear this a lot in cancer land is that patients tend to pivot professionally quite a bit. And oftentimes it, it reflects that growing interest in, you know, the work that you do for real recovery and epic experience doesn't just, you know, fill a need professionally. It fills a need personally and, yeah. and, and passion wise. Definitely. Uh, yeah, definitely. I always said like when I wanted to get in the medical field, I, I want to help people, you know, like I, I've always wanted to help people. Now I look at it. It's like, I still help people just in a different way, you know, yeah. especially like at these uh, camps and things like that. It's like, we're, helping people grow it's not like a doctor but it's still like helping someone along their journey or cruise or whatever you know yeah 100 percent. And, and and man i'm so thankful that there's people like you out there who take take that challenge and and turn again you get thrown lemons sometimes yeah. you get you got to make lemonade i know it's cliche but you are a great example of someone who's doing that and impacting others um so yeah. as we well i guess you know when you look ahead, another cliche question, but if you think about yourself five years down the road, I guess what's motivating you now personally and professionally and where do you want to be personally and professionally, you know, five years down the road, 10 years down the road? Yeah. So I'll go back to um, what Kaylin was just saying um, hmm. with the degree that wasn't really, you know, not really what I'm doing. Like I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm getting, going full circle now. So like, Right now, what motivates me is uh, physical activity with cancer survivors, right? And mm. uh, just knowing myself, like I struggled so much, like going through treatment with my weight, like I was on steroids. So I was up all night, like, and hungry the entire time. So I was eating and like throughout the course of my treatment, I gained 70 pounds, 
right? And so yeah. to get it off uh, within 18 months after treatment, but then after the relapse, I started slowly creeping back up in weight. Mm-hmm. And, um, by then, I, I got involved with uh, University of North Carolina. They have a program called the Impact Study for Young Adult Cancer Survivors, and it's basically, uh, it's, it's a study to show the impact of, or not show, but to see if there's an impact on physical activity, or a impact of physical activity on um, like your general mental health and also just like um, weight as well. And so I, I was involved with that program for 12 months and I lost 40 pounds and I continued it. And like up to date, I'm at 70 pounds now, but it's such a, long story short, it's such a huge need in the community. Like it's so cliche, like people think cancer survivor and it's like, oh, they're skinny and bald, you know, like that's definitely not <laughs> all the case, right? Yeah, it's <laughs> not always the case. And so like I people struggling with their weight, like going through treatment and it could be for a variety of reasons, but um, it's like, how do we help these people? Like not only with their weight, but with um, just overall mental health and well-being yeah. in the process. And so that's what's driving me now. Uh, really, I, I really want to get into that space a little more. And I always say I want to um, combine tech and physical activity in a way that's beneficial to the uh, cancer community. And so that's what I'm working on now. I'm actually a community advisory uh, board member for the study. And uh, yeah. Um, awesome. Well, other, other organizations working with in that space, too. And we'll see where it goes. I but love it. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that is that is important stuff. That is huge impact. I, I'm excited to see where you're headed with it. Yeah. Um, so I've been doing this thing. Uh, we, we're in um, we're in this weird place of uh, quarantine or half quarantine or the, the COVID crisis, right? Mm-hmm. So I've been doing this thing where I have this uh, stuck in the man cave uh, mini podcasts where I just have 10 minute talks with people about cancer and COVID and isolation, right? And one of the things that I do at the end of those episodes is I have the man, well, it's the man up to cancer hot seat. And today I think is going to be a great day. Kellen is, I'm surprising Kellen with this as well. We are <laughs> going to do the man up to cancer hot seat in the podcast today. I'm, I'm hope I'm thinking it might be a regular, a regular piece of the podcast, but we're going to experiment <laughs> with you, Jay. Jay's sure. going to be the first one to do this. So I have some questions here. These m- probably won't get into cancer or COVID, but they might but they're pretty random. So I'm going to ask Jay and I'm also going to ask Kellen the hot seat questions. Are you ready? Sure. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Kellen, I like how, Kellen's looking at me like, well, mm. no, I'll, I'll, both he and I are like looking at you tentatively being like, all right. Like, all, right all right, guys, gotta go. Sorry. Hey, no, 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 no. I, hey, everyone has made it through the gauntlet. Okay. You're, you're going to okay. make it. Here we go. Number one, pineapple on pizza. Yes or no. Yes. I'm a, yes, I'm a big yes. I, I love it. Okay, you guys are out. You're both uh, you're both banished. The answer is no, but I'm outnumbered today, two to one. All right. Pineapple, ham, and onions. Like, don't knock Ooh, it. Ooh, I've had the pineapple and ham. I have not added the onions. Oh. Add the onions. It's a game changer. I'm, I'm disgusted. I'm no, just... I like, I don't know. I feel like people are too judgmental about what people put on their pizza. You I can am. put whatever you want on your pizza. No, no, like, I'm, I'm judging you so hard right now. Um, number two, Jay. If you could sure. be any athlete, any athlete for one event, who would it be? Ooh, that's a tough one. Probably say LeBron, though, just because we're the same age, you know? So, like, like a LeBron in a finals game, like game seven? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> like, is it because you actually have an interest in basketball or you just want to be really good at that sport? Like, whatever sport, you know, just the pinnacle. Yeah, it'd just be the, the best. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, Ke- Kellen. <laughs> same question yeah same question okay not because i have any ability in this at all but when you see simone biles fly through the air and flip as many times as she does i don't want to do it all the time but like just once i'd be able like want to see what that feels like (laughs) just to get your body to do that right i'm getting dizzy just thinking about yeah 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 no i throw up on the other side but i just (laughs) okay um What's the worst style choice you ever made, Jay? Oh. Can be fashion choice, Probably hair. Fashion. I'd, I'd say fashion in high school. 
you know, okay. like I started high school in 99. And so it's still like basically in the 90, the nineties. And I look back on some of the pictures now and it's just the clothes, what were we wearing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Except for they're coming back now and you see teenagers yeah. wearing, you're like, Oh, mom jeans weren't awesome. Then why are we, the, why are these coming back? Right. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> um, it's coming back rollerblades. Actually. Yes. <laughs> my husband and my, my six year old have been rollerblading in our neighborhood and it is kind of hilarious to see yes. them come back. And they are the same rollerblades that my husband wore in college. Oh, so no it's, yeah, <laughs> it's just yeah. it's so funny. If you could eat, only one food for the rest of your life what would it be and you have to be specific fresh oh. baked fe- fresh uh, baked bread fresh baked bread coming straight out of, i mean that's it. like yeah. a classic woman from the woods of vermont oh, she yeah. wants baked <laughs> bread like homemade bread yeah, with butter with churned butter oh okay. my gosh jay i'm going any, to you any carb <laughs> i would do yeah carbs are great i would do a turkey and swiss on wheat with avocado and baby spinach is that like wow that's bam. so fancy uh, bam. Like, <laughs> he's going for like actual nutrients where i was like right. just carbs <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> now, now i'm hungry <laughs> you guys can do a combo you can have that sandwich on kellen's fresh baked bread yeah. from the farm yeah. in vermont Let's all right do. um what what place jay what place in the u.s would you most like to visit that you've never been to before oh i'd probably say the florida keys i've never been but yeah. uh seems nice just not in hurricane season but <laughs> <laughs> i mean i can't argue with that kellen uh you know i've never been to northern california and since he's like been talking about it it's one of the places that like to see the big redwoods i just really want to yes i Beautiful. love it okay last question um do you have pump up music who pump like up. yeah what's your pump up music what's your go-to like if you needed to pump yourself up for like a big uh, outdoor yeah. event or yeah, what's in your I, playlist yeah i have a pre-made playlist on apple music yeah like i switch between apple music and spotify and like i don't even know what they are but they're just like um like workout type music uh, well, what genre so it's uh what is it like electronic is the one i go to oh all right okay heavy beats he's going yeah, for right, heavy beats right. and like uh, yeah i love it kellen how do you get pumped up when you're in the backwoods of vermont i you're listen about to, go, to you know, either, i have like skiing. two people that i listen to on a regular basis to pump me up one is actually it's tegan and sarah which is a band it's two oh, yeah. sisters and childish gambino those are like the two <laughs> that i go to regularly but tegan and sarah is safe to play with my kids Childish Gambino is not. So it depends on if I have my kids with me or not. <laughs> All right. Deal. Um, actually, I'm going to, I'll finish up with one more question for Jay. Um, this is a question that I often go back to. It's kind of my go-to. Uh, it, the zombie apocalypse is upon us and you can only choose one weapon to get you through. What is Jay Carter going to be, you know, wielding to get rid of the zombies? Probably an ax. <laughs> <laughs> Like a, I can see you with like a double-edged axe, just yes. like just <laughs> spinning around. Yes. All right. Yeah, yeah. See, that wasn't so bad. You guys both oh, made it through. You both made yeah. it through the gauntlet. Um, Jay, it's been a real pleasure having you on the podcast. Um, we are, I'm psyched to be connected to you now and I'm excited to see the impact that you're making already and that you're going to. Um, so don't be a stranger. Take care, brother. Definitely. Thanks for having me. And uh, thanks, Kellen, too. And yeah. Hopefully I wasn't uh, too horrible. <laughs> you were just the right amount of horrible. Yeah, we don't, we don't, we don't want perfect guests here. They're not allowed. You're no. like, a, you're like a solid A. Good job. <laughs> Alrighty, I can pro- I can just send it in the link or something in Google Drive or something. You'll, yeah, I'm like you. you yeah. You'll, <laughs> yeah, it. you'll tell me how to get it. <laughs> yeah. All right, awesome. Hey, yeah. thanks, man. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, yeah. guys. <laughs> No, I'm probably going to switch my position though. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, no, I.